Dad. Dad. I think it's probably a good and appropriate time for us to honor dads who have consistently answered the call to fatherhood with a round of applause, right? <laughs> you know, for me, when I watch videos like that, I think there's just something that uniquely, you know, it has been created in men to really answer that call in our young people's lives. Um, and whenever you watch something like this, you know, there's a part of you that recognizes that that's not necessarily how the world is, though. Um, we know that there's some problems, and uh, one of the things that I'd like to do today, my primary audience today is gonna be dads, right? Um, it is Father's Day, and so we're gonna have a, a special Father's Day message. But at the same time, you may hear that, and you may think to yourself, well, this doesn't apply to me. You know, I don't have kids, or uh, I'm, I'm a mom, you know, or, or maybe you have a background where you just don't, you didn't know your dad, maybe your dad you, and you just have some tension, and. It's just difficult, and so whenever you have one of these messages, it's like, well, you know, how do you how do you handle you know encouraging men, but at the same time understanding where everyone else is at? Here's the only thing I can do. Um, when we open up scripture, it's not Jonathan talking. Like when we open up scripture and we read scripture, like this is God's word, and so we're going to open up scripture today. And so I've got a message that I think God has prepared uh, for me to share with you, but maybe God has a different message for you. We're going to be talking about answering the call to fatherhood, and I would encourage you to think maybe beyond just a dad and what he needs to do for his kids, and maybe what we as a church family need to do when it comes to answer, answering the call to fatherhood. Because like I said, there's a growing problem in our country, and it's with fatherlessness. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a problem so much so that some people in the United States are viewing this as a crisis. I'm going to share a few of the statistics with you. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 10.5 million children, that's almost two out of every five kids, are actually in fatherless homes. That's a lot of kids without dads in their homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of children who are dealing with behavioral disorders, again, fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescents who are dealing with some sort of chemical abuse issue are patients in drug treatment centers are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth in prison are from, you guessed it, fatherless homes. And so when we read this, we know, man, that's, that's a pretty big problem. But at the same time, we realize that somehow, like men and fathers are uniquely designed to help solve some of these problems. There was a child psychologist about 30 years ago who reminded us, his name is Michael Lamb, he reminded us that the, the father um, is actually that forgotten entity in, in contributing to child development. Like you typically think of moms, but there's a unique role that fathers also play. Research has told us that children who have involved fathers have a stronger cognitive and motor skills. They have uh, the ability to um, evaluate, um, uh, sorry, um, they have elevated physical and mental health. They become better problem solvers and are more confident. They're curious and empathetic. And when I share these things, uh, on one hand, I think that it might discourage some, but I don't want it to necessarily be a discouragement. I want it to be a call for us to, again, answer the call to fatherlessness. This is something that, even when I share it, I, I think to myself, well, Am I going to be hurting mom's feelings when, when I'm saying the importance of dads and, and their role? And so moms, let me just dial back on some of those statistics and, and, and not just emphasize, hey, dads are really, really important. Because moms, you are very, very important. In fact, uh, I don't think I have to share any statistics having to do with the importance of moms developing their children. Because all of you would look at me and say, yeah, duh, obvious. Like, moms are really, really important. And, and so I would even stress it this way. Moms, anything that we're going to be talking today uh, about, it's not, it's not, again, maybe you, you're coming from a, a background where you're, your husband's not really engaged, you know, spiritually in, in the life of your kids, or maybe you're uh, a single mom. Let me just challenge you with this. Um, God loves to do the exceptional in the lives and the hearts of people who are fully devoted to him. 
And so wherever you're at, understand, moms, you've, you've got straight A's. Like, by and large, you've got gold stars because you've answered the call to motherhood. And so the crisis, the, the, the struggle that we're dealing with here in the United States, it does not rest on your shoulders. It, it rests on the shoulders of men who need to answer the call to fatherhood. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we're going to be discussing today. I was reading, again, just to kind of give one more statistic, because there's a spiritual element to this. Um, Promise Keepers came out with this statistic. and In fact, they did it in conjunction with uh, Baptist Press. And, and they were talking about the importance of, of fathers in the home. And this is what they said on a spiritual level. If a father does not go to church, even if, even if his wife is going to church, only one in 50 kids will become regular worship pretenders when they're adults. Just one in 50. Now, on the other hand, when the father regularly attends church, even if the mother does not, 66% of children will end up becoming worship attenders when they're adults. Again, one more. When both husband, this is the good news, right? When both husband and wife attend church, 75% of kids will become regular worship attenders when they're adults. So it's really important for fathers to be engaged here. And again, if you're one of those people that might have that exception, that you, you know, dad's not around, uh, your husband's not really spiritually engaged, we have a God who loves to do the exceptional and, and people who are fully devoted. And so we, as a church, we want to help support and encourage you wherever you're at. But again, primary audience here is dads. And so we're going to be talking about answering the call to fatherhood, and we're going to look at God's example to his son. Today, we're going to be hanging out in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be hanging out specifically at the Jordan. We're going to be looking at the baptism of Jesus and if you are a student of Scripture, you might be aware that uh, the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, and the book of Luke all record the baptism of Jesus. And because you've got three out of the four Gospels that talk about this event, there's a lot of speculation as to, okay, well, who was actually present at the baptism of Jesus? And most people immediately will answer, like, well, of course, John was there. Like, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And Matthew and Mark make that pretty clear. But then Luke shows up, and he kind of throws a wrench into that idea, and it almost seems like maybe, maybe Luke has said something else. And if you read the account in Luke, we have uh, the account talking about mainly John the Baptist and his bold ministry and all the things that he's doing, and it's so bold and it's so controversial, particularly with Herod, that he ends up getting arrested for being so bold and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And so after his arrest is when Luke decides to record Jesus' baptism. And so some people will scratch their head and like, wait a minute, was it actually John who ended up baptizing Jesus? Was John even present for this thing? Is there a contradiction here? Now, if you read the account in Luke, I think there's a, it's obvious. What, John, or what Luke has done is he's talked about the ministry of John, and he's just he's extended it a little bit because it's a story, right? And then he gets to his uh, arrest, and he backtracks, and then he talks about Jesus' baptism, which he was involved in. Now, I think it's pretty obvious, but some people have said maybe John wasn't even at the baptism of Jesus. Also, when it comes to other folks, we know that Andrew was actually a disciple of Jesus, but who was he a disciple of before Jesus? John the Baptist. So people wonder, I wonder if Andrew was able to witness like, the baptism of Jesus. And then what, I mean, what mom doesn't want to experience her son's baptism? So was Mary there? I mean, Mary had to have been present at Jesus' baptism. Thing is, we don't know. We don't know exactly who was there, with one exception. We know that God was there. And so we're going to read this account. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So we get a picture of how we can answer the call to fatherhood through God interacting with his Son, Jesus. What is the first step in answering the call to fatherhood? Well, you're present. You show up. Like, that's what we need to do as dads. We need to be present. We need to show up. This is what 
G or this is what Jesus received from his heavenly father. And I think there's a lot of wonderful things in this section of scripture. And uh, a lot of people have probably emphasized, you know, the fact that we see the triune God in this, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But one of the things that I find really interesting is this is actually the first time in 400 years that God is actually recorded as speaking. And the last time we have any recording of him speaking was all the way back, the last book in the Bible, Malachi. This prophet spoke on God's behalf. And even when, you know, Jesus was going to enter the world, when God wanted to communicate to Mary and Joseph, as well as to the uh, wise men and the shepherds, well, what did he use? He used angels. This is the first time that he has actually spoken anything. So the question I have is, well, what's the big deal, right? If you're going to be silent for practically 400 years, like, why now? What's so important now? I think the answer, hopefully, is obvious. It's because it has to do with his son. Like, this is an important event. This, is, this marks the beginning of Jesus' public earthly ministry. And so, of course, he's going to show up. Of course, he's going to be present, and he's going to confirm Jesus. Uh, fathers, I think sometimes we, we think that our love for our kids will just automatically equal influence. Like, we have this idea that because we have some sort of affection for our kids, that sometimes it's just going to naturally mean influence. And what I, what I mean by that is, um, you know, when we watch that video, like, we've got these kids. They're all saying, Dad, Dad, Dad. And we watch that, and it's like, oh, yeah, I, th I think I'm that dad. Like, if my kid texts me and is like, hey, I need you, got some breakdown, like, we're going to be there. We're going to show up for that. You know, if there's some sort of emergency, there's, like, some fire that's, like, bursting out of the, the grill, like, we're going we're gonna to try to put that out, right? We're going to show up for these things. But you guys notice in these verses, Jesus doesn't actually have to make a prayer for God to show up. He doesn't have to ask Dad. It's like, oh, you know, I'm a little concerned. I know this is the beginning of my public ministry. I don't know if I'm ready for this. Dad, would you just kind of confirm this over me, for me? Does he have to do any of that? No, God just shows up. He's present. This is what, this is what it means to answer the call to fatherhood. You know, one of the uh, mistakes that I think we oftentimes make is, particularly in those early years, we just kind of assume that the domain of, uh, of, of parenting is the, particularly those early years, is really the domain of mom. Like, that's, that's their role. Um, we'll, we'll get involved when our kids become a little bit more interesting, like when they're able to actually articulate, you know, proper sentences. Here's the thing, though. Like, for a lot of kids, that doesn't actually happen until their late 20s, right? You, you know you know that's true. So you're going to miss out on almost, like, three decades of, like, involvement with your kids. And, and I think this is a mistake that I've even fallen into. Moms, you're so good at nurturing these kids. But for us, sometimes, if, if they're not interested in what we're interested in, we're not really that interested in them. Like, if somehow they get involved in the sports that we got involved in, the hobbies that we were interested in, then we'll find ourselves getting interested. But I just want to encourage you dads. If you're a dad, it's not their job to show up in your world. It's your job to show up in their world. You've got to be present. You've got to show up. Uh, I don't know if you remember this movie, but back in the early 90s, there was a movie called Boys in the Hood. Now, back in the early 90s, I was definitely not allowed to watch Boys in the Hood. Maybe you were, I don't know. Um, but the movie, it, I'm not even necessarily recommending it, but uh, it's one of those classic coming-of-age movies. We've got a, a kid who's growing up with his mom. Mom and dad are separated, and he's just getting into all kinds of trouble. And so mom suggests, hey, you need to go live with your dad. Now, dad lives in South Central Los Angeles, so gangs, violence, a lot of trouble there. But he goes, and he goes lives with dad. And early on in the movie, there's this scene where the dad is actually interacting with some of the neighbor boys, and he's, he's trying to get them to rake his yard, and he's saying, hey, you know, if you, if you rake the yard, I'll give you $5. And the kids are like, $5? $5 isn't anything. He's like, well, that's too bad. You're going to miss out on, on some money, and now I'm going to have to make my boy do this. And sure enough, they don't care about him, so he makes his boy rake the leaves. And I don't even remember if he gave him $5 for the raking of the leaves. And so his, his son's feeling a little put out, and so he sits down with his son, and he says, son, I understand you, you, you feel like I'm, I'm hard on you. And then he looks over, and he points at those other boys, and he says, but here's the thing. They don't have dads. Their dads are not involved in their life. 
And you just wait, and you just see what's going to happen to them later on in life. And sure enough, as the movie goes on, they make some poor choices, and their life becomes a ruin. And I know it's just a movie, but here's the thing. We read the statistics. Like, we know what ends up happening when dads are not involved. And I wonder to myself, when it comes to hey, answering the call of fatherhood, what would, it, what would have, it have actually cost that dad that every single time he took his son to go get ice cream, if he invited those couple of kids along with him? And, and every time they did a camping trip, would it have been that much more inconvenient to actually have those kids come as well? And what if he was working on his car or working on his house or learning some sort of life skill if, if not only he was training his own son, but maybe he was training these neighbor kids as well. What kind of impact could that have possibly had on these other kids' lives? And so although today I'm talking primarily to dads, I think there's something in this for all of us. How can we all answer this call to fatherhood? I don't know if you're aware of this. We haven't done a whole lot of advertisement, advertising about it, but thanks to Joanna and, uh, and Tara, um, we're actually just trying to start a program here at our church called the Buddy Program. Um, and the whole idea is to kind of find adults for kids who are in elementary uh, and those who are early middle school, an adult to pair up with them, kind of almost like a mentoring program. A and I'm sharing this with you now because, like, like I said, I think we all have a call that God has placed on our heart to father people well, just like our Heavenly Father has fathered us well. And so I'm not going to say sign up for anything. I'm not even going to have you, you know, necessarily even pray about it. But here's what I'd like to do. If you hear that and there's something in your mind that just can't get away from it, like maybe this week you're eating breakfast and all of a sudden it kind of just pops in your mind, hey, the buddy program, I wonder who's going to sign up for that. And then maybe a few days later, you're just doing some chores, and you're like, oh yeah, the buddy program at church. I wonder who's going to sign up for that. Like, if you can't get it out of your head, and it just kind of keeps popping in your mind, maybe that's the Holy Spirit who's saying, I need you to help father kids well. And, and obviously Josh, he's got all kinds of stuff going on with the youth, and he's always looking for volunteers. We, we've got teens that need support. Uh, we've got teens that need that infrastructure in their life. If maybe that's something that God is laying on your heart, talk to, talk to Josh. But again, going back to the buddy program, if you can't get away from it, maybe have a conversation with, uh, with Joanna about it. Maybe have a conversation with Tara about it. But I think we all can answer the call to fatherhood. I'm going to read you guys verses 16 and 17 once again. It says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It's a great section of Scripture. And what do we see? We see God being present, being that good Father who shows up. I want to read to you another section of Scripture. This is in Luke chapter 1. You would normally hear this read around Christmas time. This is when the angel shows up to, to Mary, just kind of freaks her out and says, this is what your life is going to be. And she's like, oh my goodness, how can this happen? And so he begins to tell her that the child that she's going to have is not an ordinary child. And this is how he describes this coming baby. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then later on in verse 35, he says it again. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And so what do we see in Jesus' ministry? All throughout Jesus' ministry, people begin to recognize, okay, he's not just somebody. Like, he's somebody special. Nathaniel was one of those first people. If you guys read John 1, we have this uh, moment where Jesus is trying to find his disciples, and uh, he has this interaction with Nathaniel, and Nathaniel's like, whoa, wait. You're somebody special. And what does he say? You're the Son of God. And then later in Matthew chapter 16, Peter, he's quick to say, Jesus, I know a lot of people think you're a lot of different people, but I know who you are. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And then even at the cross, when a Roman soldier helps put Jesus to death, he looks up at Jesus and he says, clearly, this was the Son of God. Over and over and over again, we have this spoken into Jesus' life. But who was the first one? Who was the first one to speak this truth over Jesus? It was, it was God. It was his dad. His dad did this. Men, we need to learn something about fatherhood here. 
So not only do we need to show up, not only do we need to be present, but guys, we as fathers, we actually need to help influence identity. We need to help shape our children's identity specifically in Christ. How is, how is God doing this? Notice what he says. He says, this is my son. In other words, that's my boy. There he is right there. That's, that's my boy. That's my son. Right? There's, there's pride there. There's excitement there about his future in life. For us as fathers, we need to step in and we need to speak clearly identity into our children. Um, why is this so, so important? I think one of the reasons why this is so important is because this happens in chapter 3. Right? This is chapter 3, Jesus speaking or receiving this truth from God. But then comes chapter 4. And I know, Bruce is like, wait, what? So, so 4 comes after 3? Um, you know, and he's just trying to, he's trying to figure it out. Here's the thing. Chapter 3, chapter 3 is the Jordan experience. Chapter, sorry, chapter 3 is the Jordan experience. Chapter 4 is the wilderness experience. So what we have happening in chapter 3, well, that's the baptism. What happens in chapter 4? That's the temptation. So in chapter 3, Jesus remind, is reminded by God of who he is, all this truth spoken into his heart and soul. And in chapter 4, we have all these lies that start happening in his heart. Like, what's the first thing? Do you guys remember? What was the first thing that Satan says to try to attack Jesus? If, if you really are the Son of God. Where's he going? He's going right for his identity. Because he knows if he can hit that identity piece, man, all kinds of havoc can be done. Who are you? What's your identity? See, Jesus, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't actually uh, taken in by any of this. Why? Because what happened 40 days earlier? I, got, I would love to have had the conversation go something like this. Hey, if you really are the son of God. He's like, oh yeah, you know, tricky. I, I see what you're doing. But you clearly must not have been there 40 days earlier. Because 40 days earlier, my father told me exactly who I am. And so your little lies, they're not going to have any effect on me. So we've got an enemy that wants to go and change and tweak and warp our identity. But we have to hold on to what our fathers have told us. And if we're consistently, as fathers, speaking God's identity into our children, taking, um, taking stories and, and, and even and challenging them with questions about who they are, what are you doing? You're, you're setting them up for their future successes. I do this with my kids. I, I consistently ask them, typically when I think they've forgotten the answer, I typically ask them, who are you? I just ask them, who are you? And my kids know where I'm going with it at this point, and so they never answer, well, my name's Owen. My name's Travis. Like that, they know it. There's something more. There's something deeper there. So I say, hey, who are you? And they'll say, well, I'm a child of God. Well, who are you? I'm a follower of Christ. Who are you? I am a Christian. And then typically, because it, I'm usually asking them because I think they've forgotten, usually the follow-up question is, okay, well, if this is who you are, well, what do you need to do in this situation? I probably need to love a little bit more. Yeah, I think so. What about right here in this situation? Yeah. Okay, because I'm a follower of Christ, I probably need to give a little bit more grace and not be quite as selfish in the situation. Yeah, you're probably right. What am I doing? What am I trying to do as a father? I'm trying to shape their identity because there is an enemy who wants to do that very same thing. There's an enemy that wants to shape our kids' identity and warp them in such a way so that they can just bring all kinds of havoc to this world. I, I've told you guys this before, um, but every single week I'll take one of my boys out for what is called a day out with dad. I'm going to emphasize day out with dad because recently I was at the park with one of my boys and someone was like, oh, is this your date out with your dad? And I was like, no, 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 we keep it masculine at the Gleason home. This is his day out, not his date with dad. It was funny. It was Travis. And he's like, yeah, I'm dating my dad. You know, and it's like, ha, 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 right? Um, <laughs> It's a day out, day out with dad. And it's just a couple hours uh, once a week with, with one of my boys. And um, I do four things. Like we do something fun together. Like we go to the park and play. We go swim and whatever. Usually there's some sort of junk food that was, that was bought for them because hanging out with dad's always more fun with junk food. Uh, and then we open up scripture. We see what our heavenly father has to say to us. I pray for them. I pray over them. And then the fourth thing I do is um, like I, I speak words of encouragement to them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back uh, on this one just for a moment because it, it probably hits what Jesus has said a little bit better um, in, in just a few verses. But, you know, every time, every time that you need to, to speak some encouragement into your children, I, I encourage you, um, don't miss out on those opportunities. You know, shape their identity. Uh, you know, what, 
Are you familiar? How many of you guys have watched The Lion King before? Has anyone seen The Lion King? Do you guys realize that? Like, that's like one of the best gospel movies of all time. You guys realize that this is like one of the best gospel movies of all time. John, are you in agreement with that one? Okay, so here's the thing. If, for those, have the, if you guys have not seen The Lion King, let me just tell you, you're 25 years like way behind the times, and you should probably see The Lion King. Um, but what does the story involve? We, we've got a, uh, an individual named Mufasa, right? He's the, he's the king of this pride of lions. He's the king of the savannah. And, and what do we see uh, him doing? He's having this child, and what is he doing? He's speaking truth into his child. What's his child's name? Simba, young Simba, right? You hold him up and you know, everyone bows and the whole thing. But we see early on in the movie that Mufasa is speaking all this truth into his life because he's setting him up for his destiny. destiny. He's saying, hey, you're going to be the king one day. You're going to be this king that you're going to be ruling the savannah. And so you need to be able to do it well. Uh, there's a problem, though, right? The problem is there's a character named Scar. And Scar eventually kills Mufasa, and then he begins to lie. He begins to speak these lies into Simba's heart. And so Simba goes running. Now Simba finds himself in the jungle. And he finds some fun friends, right? Uh, Timon and Pumbaa. And what are they doing? They're singing. Because there's no worries. They, I mean, it's just one party after the other in the jungle. Everything's great. But Simba's not living out his destiny, is he? And so he encounters this little monkey witch doctor character named Rafiki. Rafiki. And Rafiki, Rafiki says, hey, uh, I know your dad. He's like, wait, you know my dad? Yeah, well, take me to my dad. And so they go running through the jungle, acting all weird. And uh, eventually, um, he leads them to this body of water. And Simba looks into the water. And all he sees is his own reflection. And he's looking at himself, and he's thinking, well, this isn't what I wanted. And then as he stares a little bit deeper, he begins to see the reflection of his father in himself. And he begins to hear the voice of the father speaking to him. And the father is saying, you are more, you are more than what you have become. And then there's that, that truth, all those truths that dad had spoken into his life about his future destiny that fill him with courage. And so what does he do? Like he goes running back and he defeats Scar and he wins the day. And if you guys have not seen that movie, I apologize because I've just totally like ruined the entire movie for you. But dads, dads, there's just something, there's just something special. There's something unique about when we have the opportunity to speak truth into our children's lives. You know, there again, there's an enemy. What's the enemy trying to do? The enemy is trying to deceive. But every single time that you can actually speak their identity in Christ into their heart. You're setting them up for success. Here's what I mean by that. Like if you step in and you say, you know, son, if you're in Christ, this is how you live. Well, the next time that a friend says, hey, you want to try this? They're going to go, no, <laughs> I'm not about that. And the next time they hear these messages from the world, and you know they're all out there, that's creating some sort of confusion in their minds about sexuality, about who they are biologically, about their gender. Like if you've already spoken this truth into their lives, I mean, they're going to know how to handle that. And every time that someone says you're ugly, someone says you're a failure, every time someone says you're not going to measure up, you're stupid, and that's going to happen. Like kids can be cruel. Adults can be cruel. We can fail at things. When these things happen, if we as fathers have spoken Christ's identity into them, they're not going to be shaken. Why? Because their identity is not in those things. We can fail, and that's okay to fail because Christ has already won the victory. And when we understand who we are, well, then we won't be shaken. And so we, we need to step in as fathers and speak this truth. What else? What else do we learn? We learn not only do we need to show up, not only do we need to be present, right? Not only do we need to shape identity, but then verse, uh, let me turn back to Matthew here. But then verse 17 explains also, that we need to also speak love and affirmation into our, our, our children's lives. So then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. What do we see Jesus receiving from the Father? Love and affirmation. I think it's really interesting, though, that when he says, you know, I'm well pleased, Jesus hasn't done a whole lot. You guys realize that? He hasn't really done much. No miracles. Right? No water and wine, no tearing off bread and fish and feeding 5,000. He hasn't had those moments where he turned 
someone who is blind to someone who can see. He hasn't encountered the religious leaders and rebuked them for their hypocrisy. He hasn't preached to thousands of people. He hasn't lifted those who are marginalized up to, to a place of status. Like he hasn't done any of these things. So how can God say, I'm well pleased, I'm well pleased with you? Because it's not about what Jesus has done. It's about who he is. And fathers, I think so often we just get into this routine of behavioral management, and maybe we just need to step in and just appreciate and affirm our children simply for who they are, not necessarily what they're doing. And I think it's really clear, too, we need to speak that love into their life. I was talking with a group of of teenagers, this was a few years ago, and I don't know how we came up on this conversation, but I just asked them, so in your homes, do you guys say I love you much? Like, do your parents say that to you, and do you say it to your parents and your siblings? And I got kind of a, eh, sometimes, not really. You know, you don't want to wear stuff like that out. It stop, stops meaning something. I was like, nah, nah. I'm going to wear that thing out in my home. Like, I'm just going to say that as often as I can. And I, I'm honestly telling you, that is the most spoken phrase in our home. Like, we constantly are telling each other, I love you. It's the first thing that I tell my boys in the morning when I wake them up. It is the last thing I tell my kids when I put them down to bed at night. Even when I leave, the last thing I want them to hear out of my mouth are the words, I love you, because I've got this weird idea that if something were to happen to me and I were to die and not make it back to them, I want the only thing rattling around in their mind is the words of their dad, I love you. And so while I sit down with my kids, whether it's that day out with dad uh, or we're just hanging out and they're just being cool, like I just want to affirm that I love them. And so I speak that as often as I can. And going back to even, you know, having a, uh, that, that sit-down time, that one-on-one time with my kids, it's really fun because I'll sit down and I'll, I'll tell them that I love them. And it, in fact, even in those times where we're hanging out the, the day out with Dad, um, I'll typically move into that conversation by saying, hey, are you ready to hear some words of affirmation? You ready to hear some reasons why Dad loves you so much? And they go, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. And so I'll take a few minutes to share that with them. And then I've got a couple of boys that when I'm finished, you know what they say afterwards? Can I hear another one? <laughs> Can you tell me another one, Dad? I'm like, boy, I only have one, and that was like half made up, so I don't know if I No, I'm teasing. I, I give them another one, right? I, I, I share a second, and then they ask again, and I share a third, and I share a fourth, because there's just something unique. There's something unique about hearing this from a parent, from a father, that you're loved. And it brings some affirmation and some value to your life. We see this in the example that God gives us as he interacts with his son Jesus. And I would even challenge and encourage you, do this even when they're not behaving well. I I have a tendency, like when my kids are behaving well, it's like, oh man, thanks for doing that. Love you, buddy, right? But then there's times where I think I need to do it a little bit more even when maybe they're not behaving well. And it's those times where my voice is getting raised and I'm just like, you don't understand. You know, you need to listen to me. And sometimes I just find myself like, okay, wait. <sighs> Deep breath. <clears throat> okay, I love you, bud. And I'm going to love you whether you are the president of the United States or you're only working a part-time, like, under the minimum wage type of job. I'm going to love you in either situation. I- I'm going to love you if you are behaving well all the time or you are kind of rotten, right? I'm still going to love you. I'm going to love you if you find some miraculous way to like, finish college in three years. And I'm going to love you if it requires six or seven years to finish college. I mean, there's going to be a conversation, like, I'm sure, like, about that, because if, if I'm paying, like, you better be hurrying, right? But here's the thing. I love you in all these situations. And, and so I, I want to challenge, and I want to leave you guys with this challenge. <clears throat> How about we all answer the call to fatherhood? I get it. Some of you don't have kids. So you're like, how am I going to do that? And some of you, you're, you're women. You're like, well, how am I going to be a father? Like, how does that work? I think we all need to, and I think this is as a church. Can I just give this as a, a, a church call? How about we all look for folks in our life this week, in the weeks to come, who need to experience the love from the Father? And how about in their lives we're present? How about in their lives we begin to shape their identity with Christ and his truth? How about in their lives that we speak words of affirmation and love over their lives? Because when we decide to do this, we're actually participating in the same fatherliness that God has actually shown Jesus and ourselves. Let's pray. God, thank you for 
being that perfect dad. Father, giving us such a wonderful example of love, giving us such a wonderful example of, of wanting to protect us from the enemy, giving us a, a wonderful example of the fact that you're always with us even when we might feel abandoned. Father, you are a God who cares. And Father, I pray that on this Father's Day, um, that although we might be celebrating you know, our earthly dads, that we'll take the time to celebrate you, our Heavenly Father. I pray this in your son Jesus' name.